we have another foggy day. <laughs> I, uh, this foggy day has really been a moist, wet one, you know, where everything has gotten coated with, with water. And, uh, I love the smell and I love the chill. It's just, oh, I don't know. It's kind of nice. I, I enjoy the times that I get a chance to kind of sit outside and think and recognize how far the Lord has brought me, you know, from where I was to where I am. And kind of the process that you go through, you know, day by day when you walk with God, when you talk with Him, when you take the time, whether it be every day or once a week or twice a week or whatever in your schedule that you've started by setting a certain amount of time to be with God and then wound up hopefully expanding that. <laughs> I remember, it's interesting, is that the devotional today would be talking about Satan. And while that's a interesting topic, I think sometimes right now the world is into supernatural. You know, they want to they want to find Satan where he's not and put him where he isn't. And meanwhile, I think most of the time you find that the devil and his angels usually are just not even involved in most of what people call satanic is usually their own flesh. They have fallen for sometimes this power of inspiration, meaning that they're inspired to think a certain way. So they kind of take their eyes off of Jesus and they begin to focus in on unnatural things that aren't recorded in the scriptures, things that they ooh and ah about and their flesh feeds upon. And Satan doesn't have to do anything about that. I mean, he can just let you go on your own way. Nine times out of ten, as a matter of fact, I think nowadays that the modern man doesn't need to have this satanic attack. Most of the time, people blame the enemy of our soul for the works of the flesh that they're doing that in reality, it isn't Satan at all, but usually just their own flesh that needs to be crucified. Now, in my life, you know, to be fair, there was a time where in walking in the Spirit and serving the Lord and being involved in this ministry in uh, this town that was very heavily influenced by a lot of pagan activity, some witchcraft covens, some... Oh, you'd say carnality, I guess, but basically it was just kind of like a, not a good place to be. And maybe because of its long history and tradition, which went over a hundred years, that there was some type of curse or some type of failing there because one of the traditions that had been going on there when I arrived was that it used to be said about that town that it was where they buried pastors because, or ministers, you know, they used the word pastor, minister, or priest, you know, because it was a town where it had become such a, a common thing that the ministers ran off with their secretaries. And, you know, I didn't think much about it when I arrived there, but sure enough, one of the churches I went to, this great man of God ran off with the secretary. <laughs> it's like, well, hmm, I'll be darned. <laughs> what a surprise. And some of the things that I experienced there were definitely satanic. And, you know, they involved, very interestingly, a, a Greek, uh, not a Greek, a Russian family and some other things that were involved in areas of ministry that I had never been involved in. And I saw very dramatically in my own personal life, you know, satanic attacks and things that were definitely demonic. And I had seen those before, but, you know, it was pretty simple to allow God to do what he does. Because, you see, a lot of times people like to 
take some powers that they don't have, take some authority they don't have that God hasn't given them, and try to cast out and do things that God never told them to do. Because when God does something, it's pretty simple. You just, God, take care of it, and God does it. You know, if you want to raise someone from the dead, you just ask God to raise them from the dead, and they stand up. Jesus didn't do some, you know, mystical gyrations and go through some magic formula. He just said, rise up. And they rose up. He didn't get through some holy, you know, roller kind of jumping up and down, excited, work it up, you know, and get the people all around so they could watch, you know, kind of ministry. He just said, be healed. And they were healed, you know. There are a few times where maybe he mixed some mud or something, you know, and did some things. But those were just made perfect sense when you think about it. But I think there's a over tendency in the, the fundamentalist Christian, the Pentecostal Christian, and those that have been involved too long in the spiritual side that they forget that there's a practical side to their faith that needs to be dealt with, and that's their own flesh. And so in dealing with the subjects of Satan, Satanic, even possession, sometimes uh, gifts of the Spirit, or casting out demons and things like that, don't overblow it. Don't exaggerate it, because if you blow your hot air into it, you're going to find that you're creating for yourself a pit that you'll fall into, a stumbling block that you'll yourself stumble on. Having a sister that had once been possessed, you know, I am very familiar with what does and doesn't work. And me personally, no. There were times where she was possessed in my presence and I didn't cast out a demon in her. You know, when it happened, the person who did just simply said, in the name of Jesus, you know, they cast out the demon and they were gone, you know, poof. And even my sister was shocked, you know. Now, obviously when I mentioned the word Jesus and when I shared love for her and I had these feelings of compassion for her, it was very antagonistic towards the, the spirit that was in her. And she was very violent about it. And that kind of is what you can tell a demonic activity is that it's always violent. It's never calm. There's no peace. There's unrest. In other words, everything that you would say is a gift of the spirit or a fruit of the spirit. The opposite is true with satanic possession because your body was never meant to inhabit demons and your flesh was never meant to participate in spiritual warfare that's going on, you know, all about us. Because spiritual warfare is for spiritual battles. You know, you don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. The spirit, the, the weapons of that kind of warfare are spiritual, not physical. So when you put something that's spiritual into something that's physical, there's a conflict. There's a, a violent reaction. It's kind of like putting two chemicals together that don't belong. They just, they're like a catalyst. They explode or they resist each other. Like putting a north magnet and a south end of a magnet, and they just repel each other. That's the way it is kind of with Satan and with things that are led by the Spirit of God. They repel each other. And where there's light, darkness has to flee. So, in that, you know, don't, don't get so carried away, you know, in thinking you see demonic activity. It's not as prevalent. Usually a person that's demonic, and that is happening a lot, well, you know, they're, they're violent. That's one big indicator. They're self-destructive. They usually will be antagonistic towards the name of Jesus. If it is, you know, not that there's power in the name, but there is an antagonism against you know, sharing Jesus as he is. And it's not the issue of Jesus controversy or contradiction that people want to say, well, use the Hebrew name, not the Gentile name or whatever, the Greek name. But Satan knows what you're talking about, and the demon does too. So it's kind of one of those things. And when you run into things that are demonic, usually it's to trip you up. It's to get you involved in it so that you take your eyes off of what you were supposed to do in the first place. 
when you're heading in one direction, even as the old prophet did to the young prophet, as we recorded in the new, as is recorded in the Old Testament, God told the young prophet to go through the land and had a specific things that he told him to do. He said, don't stay in the land, don't sleep in the land, go straight through the land, and don't stop, go straight through. And the old prophet came up to him and said, hey, you know, the Lord came to me and told me that, you know, you were tired and that you should come to my house and rest, you know, and that you should spend the night, you know, and that it'll be safe in my home. And so the young prophet did, and he came to his home, and the next morning he got up and left and got ate by a bear, torn up by a lion and ate by a bear. And the moral of the story or the, the lesson we learn is that you do what God tells you to do. Satan wants to change what God said to you into what you will be doing contrary to what God said. The same way that he tripped up Eve, the same way that he tempted Jesus. He didn't tempt Jesus with power and authority and all these different things. But in each of those areas, left of the eye, left of the flesh, pride of life, he was able to present something that was just slightly contrary to what God said. And Jesus always answered according to the word of God, as he was the literal word of God. And he couldn't be tempted by his flesh. He couldn't be tempted by distraction or attraction of those things that Satan had presented. So most of your quote unquote satanic attacks you think like in flesh, like there's these books out, Pigs in a Parlor, which is, you know, wacko, or sometimes even even Peretti in some of his books has gotten a little carried away. When it's your flesh that's involved, that's not satanic. I'm sorry. You know, your flesh has been dealt with, you know. You need to crucify it. You need to fast and pray, you know, and seek the Lord and build up your spirit inside that God has placed the Holy Spirit in you so that you would yield your members, as the scripture says, to holiness and righteousness and doing the right thing. And then you'll find that your flesh can be set aside and that you can live after the spirit. But when you blame Satan for works of flesh that you're doing, that you did, that you... You weren't tempted by Satan. You were tempted by your own flesh and you gave into your own lusts. That that's just the world system that Satan may have started to provide an environment for you to trip up. It's kind of like this. If you walk into a minefield, you're probably going to get blown up. So if there's a sign that says, don't go into the minefield, God, why are you in the minefield? In other words, he didn't tell you to go there, so now that you're in it, what are you going to do about it? You're probably going to get blown up, because he didn't tell you to go there in the first place. That's the point. A lot of what you do, you bring upon yourself, and you need to take accountability and responsibility for who you are as a Christian, as a born-again Christian, that you live in a world that's antagonistic, and that the world systems are being manipulated by God, in order to accomplish his purpose, by Satan, in order to try to contradict his purposes, by man himself, in order to exist and to get what he wants selfishly. And so you have these three contrary forces at work that even though they look like they don't seem to work out, God still has that master plan that's going to be accomplished. And we, if we trust in him, with all our heart, and not into our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge Him, let Him direct our path. In that fivefold way, we will find how to walk through this world in righteousness and holiness and learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and not get distracted by the world, for one, Satan, for two, and then our own flesh, for three. Because they are working against us at times. And it's kind of like the weather, you know. If you get wet, you're liable to catch a cold. <laughs> it just makes perfect sense. So, you should always, always seek the Lord on every aspect of life. But don't blame other things that God has said exist on what may be your 
putting yourself in jeopardy about. Don't get rattled. Just think of him who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself. Reckon up and consider it all in comparison with your trials, so that you may not grow weary or exhausted, losing heart and relaxing and fainting in your minds. Hebrews 12.3 We do have authority over the devil, but that doesn't mean he will never come against us. Resisting the devil doesn't get rid of doesn't resisting the devil doesn't rid us of the problem. Rather, it rids of the source of the issue who caused the problem to come at us in the first place. The problem will still be a challenge for you to participate in or not be participant of. But standing in the faith of God's promises while we are waiting for God to do something keeps us from acting like the devil ourselves. Because you see, Peter, in listening to what Jesus was telling him, said, No, Lord, you don't want to go to Jerusalem. Far be it from you to do something like that. And Jesus looked at him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, it wasn't Peter that was Satan. <laughs> but Peter was acting in the same manner as Satan by trying to distract Jesus, by caring about Jesus, by loving Jesus, by thinking he knew what was best for Jesus, by wanting to protect Jesus from what was waiting for him in Jerusalem, which was what Jesus just said, death, to be turned over, to be scourged, to be rejected of men. I mean, who else would not have said at the same time, no, Lord, let's don't go there. Come on now. We've got a good thing going here. You know, let's witness to people. Let's do the right thing and not suffer persecution and tribulation. So that is one way in which the system of Peter's own understanding, his flesh, got in the way of what God wanted to do. And that's why a lot of times, even in the Pentecostal movement, when you hear these people say, devil, I command you in the name of Jesus to do this or, you know, to quit bugging me in these calories or don't, you know, tempt me or whatever. Nine times out of ten, eh, they just talk about their own flesh. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. It's innocent as they are and as wonderful as they may be in other areas. In some areas, they're just a little exaggeration, you know, a little giving credit where credit isn't due. <laughs> it isn't the devil that causes you to do half of what you do. 90% of what you do is your own flesh. Trust me. Satan is one angel and you're not that important. Sorry. Don't get rattled about the devil. If he causes problems for you today, just say forget it. I'm not staying hurt. I'm not staying bitter. I'm not staying wounded. I'm not staying angry. My trust is in the Lord. I'm a Christian. Watch me and be happy. In other words, Angels watch to see how you will act and how will you react according to the grace that you've been given because angels haven't been given grace. They've been given mercy in some ways. They've been given God's own direction for what he wants it to do and they've been, the fallen angels, cast out from God's presence for what they have done. So. Angels look at what we are doing and God's example of grace and salvation, pondering the things of man and how we react to them. So we set an example, not only to the angels in heaven, but the fallen angels likewise, to demonstrate the obedience to our Lord and Savior Jesus, who protects us from all these onslaughts of the enemy. Well, sure, there's thoughts that come along at peculiar times that may be principality directive, you know, meaning like you're living in some kind of area where you can feel this oppression because there's so many people. It's kind of like this. Here's what a principality is when it comes to demonic activity. A principality is like walking into a crack house. If you walk into a crack house, you know what it feels like. It doesn't feel good. There's something in the air, and it ain't crack. So if you walk into a crack house, you know what it's like. 
but you can put that into another perspective also. Now, here's the difference between a crack house, which is of the flesh because it was started by the enemy, but it's not demonic, but it's a principality. It's kind of like something that's set up. When you're in a crowd, like at a football game, suddenly what happens when your favorite team scores a touchdown? Sometimes you jump up in excitement, but sometimes you're kind of like pulled along in the excitement of the crowd as their mass hysteria of joy or excitement suddenly makes you feel this electric charge that seems to emanate from everyone and causes you to jump up and get excited too. That's what it's like, a principality, a influence or a power that's there. Principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness. Those things are influential in what you can't see, and they do affect you. Now, me, I tend to train myself to be the opposite of what mass reactions are, because I've been in crowds that have turned into mobs and seen how quickly they go crazy. And that's hard. That's a training that I taught myself a long time ago that God has used now to apply to the teaching of resist the devil, you know, and resist those things that seem to shove you or to influence you in a certain way. You kind of watch, you stop, you look, you stand, you resist. And that's what it meant by putting on the full armor of God. You kind of have to take a stand, so to speak, and not react to what actions are being presented to you. So don't always take this supernatural, easy way out to blame everything on the devil, to try to make him at fault for everything you had the opportunity to not do. But recognize at times that really it's just the world and its ways. It's just things that you put yourself into, you know, you went to that that party, that party atmosphere, and you did things you never thought you would have done because there is a power at work there. There is a principality. It's not necessarily the devil, and it's not necessarily demonic, but it is things that happen that you can't see. So, when you choose to walk with God, when you choose to be led by the Lord, when you choose to listen to his word, that he will guide your footsteps and direct you in paths where you do not walk into environments that might be like quicksand. It might only take one step in, but bingo, it sucks you down and pretty soon you're overwhelmed. Or the one time that you decide to God forbid, try some kind of drug or some kind of experience and suddenly you're sucked in by addiction. You don't know all the principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness that goes on. But don't always blame everything on the devil or on that. Sometimes it's just you and me and dealing with our flesh.